Hello, good evening and welcome again to Changing World Conversations with the University of Edinburgh which is being rolled out, hired on heels if you can do such a thing at the same time with the COP26 uh, conference in Glasgow. Now, this is a this is such a, a fascinating, all the subjects have been fascinating but this, this one is introducing a whole new concept and it's how to be a good ancestor. Uh, and it's 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 what you leave and how you change the world and what the world wants to remind remind you of and it's it's absolutely riveting. And we've got we've got cards, we've got top trunks, but we've even got a mention of David Bowie. <laughs> what more can you ask for? I have three absolutely incredible panelists joining me this evening, and I'm Susan Morrison. Now, don't forget that if you've got questions or if you've got comments you want to make, use the chat box function on on the YouTube channel, and we want to hear from you very much because you're going to find this so engaging. So, first of all, can I introduce you to Professor David Farrier? a uh, writer and literary critic who cares about what stories we're telling future generations about ourselves. Fascinating. Do you think that when the, the Iliad was being formed, they were wondering about how we'd read it in 2000 years time? Um, I, probably not, but you know, these were stories that were circulating in the moment and, and, and meeting the needs of the moment, and yet they've lasted. I think that's what's interesting about stories is they can tell us about right now, but they can also connect us to distant times as well. And, yeah, that's what we need, stories that are going to connect us to our future. Stories that are going to connect us to our future. And uh, Professor Suzanne Ewing, you're an architect and academic who cares about how we imagine and craft environments that uplift, inspire and include others. So stairs and gardens must drive you nuts. <laughs> Oh, but that's not just about inclusion. I mean, that's about amazing places that um, offer ideas of the world that are they're just sort of beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the idea of inclusion that I was sort of hinting at there is more about, um, you know, including other other sort of people, but also other bits of nature, um, mm -hmm. ideas of different kinds of spaces mm -hmm. and different kinds of cultures. Fabulous. Now, I'm mean, also being joined remotely from Orkney. It's being beamed in. <laughs> Dr. Laura Watts, you're a writer, a poet, now, and an ethnographer of futures who cares about how the future gets imagined and made. I've, I've got to say, Laura, an ethnographer of futures does sound like something from his dark materials. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, I collaborate with communities and organisations on how they imagine and make their future. So I do touch on science fiction and uh, thinking about imaginaries for sure. Imaginaries for sure. That sounds like something great. That'd be a brilliant slogan on a t-shirt. Imaginaries for sure. Put the comma in the right place. Get everyone thinking about that, getting buzzing. Thinking about what we leave, thinking about the world that we we're, we're developing, thinking about the world that we're, we've, we've been destroying in our week. Um, we've been using strategies that maybe don't work anymore. And this is where we have the concept of oblique strategies right now. This is, right, hang on, I'm going to explain this to you. Um, one of the reasons for the climate emergency is that the old way of doing things doesn't work anymore. Makes perfect sense if you think about it, because clearly it doesn't. So now I'm going to take you into a recording studio with David Bowie and Brian Eno. I know, where did that leap come from? Hang on. So apparently Brian Eno had cards and he would flash concepts up, words up to David Bowie to get around artistic blocks in the making of the, the album that they were working on. I believe it was Heroes, actually. Amongst others. Amongst others, the song Heroes. So I want you to th that image in your head of Brian, you know, flinging cards at David Bowie. If there's one <laughs> concept, one image you'll take away from the scene, it'll probably be that. But it's an oblique thinking. It's not coming, let me get this, it's not actually coming at a problem head on. Mm. It's looking at a problem around, oblique. Yeah. Mm. Like a like sailing ship trying to go forward into the wind, tacking. It's still moving forward, but it's zigzagging. It's solving its problem. So um, you have, <laughs> in the spirit of, of Brian Neal, you have oblique strategies cards, which mm. each one is going to be printed with a short prompt for thinking differently. What do you mean by thinking differently? Well, I've got some examples here. Work at a different speed. Consider gardening as architecture. And I'm quite keen on this one. Try faking it. <laughs> Obviously that doesn't work if you're driving or something like that. Um, and this this evening we're going to get David and Laura and Suzanne to offer their own oblique strategies for ways out of this current deadlock. So let's have a look. Now we've got oblique strategies cards and there's going to be nine and we've got different uh, speakers for each one and we've got different oblique strategies. So I'm going to ask each of you to speak to the oblique strategies uh, in, in sort of order and then by the way Please remember, if you've got comments, questions, 
fire them up on the on the YouTube chat box and, and we'll get to the questions as well. But let's let's look at the first card that you've you've got here. This is this is as I mentioned earlier on. It's think like a gardener, not an architect. Right. Suzanne, what do you mean by Well, I mean I think we had to start with this one because it's um you know it's very interesting. His second part of that phrase, design beginnings, not endings. So I mean as an architect, cultured for 30, 30 years in sort of thinking like an architect from a Western point of view, we are sort of trained to think about um, completing things, about sort of, you know, things that are ended, that are of a certain moment in time. So what does it mean to think differently as a, as a gardener about beginnings? It's about growing things. It's not necessarily about designing things. Um, and I think what's interesting about um, that is that there's a sense that that then um, connects back to thinking about time. Mm -hmm. So as an architect, so architect start, architecture started as a separation from building. So as a discipline, it started by saying we are separate from making things. We imagine things, they're designed and then they're applied or they, there's still a work, way of they work, work together. And so very much sort of architecture as a discipline now is kind of out of time. So it's kind of timeless sometimes. Whereas actually, um, if we can think about connecting more as a, a gardener, maybe we can think more about um, being back in time. So for me, that's what a strat an oblique strategy number one might be. And the other part of that is thinking that maybe a client might be different. So maybe a client, if you're a gardener, who's the client? Mm -hmm. Perhaps it is the planet. Perhaps it, perhaps it is, um, you know, the environment in some way. Ah, so looking at the beginnings of things and not at the ends yes. of things. Yeah. You're speaking to the wrong person, Suzanne. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've managed to kill every single plant I have ever owned. I fear not the triffids. <laughs> Come towards me, I'd have them dead in seconds. So let's, let's, oh, okay. I think, David, we're going to go to you for this one. Mm -hmm. Remember the future. I mean, remember, what? Remember the well, future. Yeah, I mean, it. I think that's that's one of the things that we need to do is to remember that actions that we're taking now, decisions we're taking now, will have profound effects on future generations. They'll shape the world that they're born into. Um, there was a report just uh, was uh, and in the newspapers I think yesterday from the economist Nicola Stern said that you know the economists are failing um, future generations. So the way that they calculate um, risk is not taking into account what future generations will inherit. And I think what we need to do is, is find ways that we can build um, the rights, the concerns, the priorities, the needs of future generations into the decisions we make now. So we need to remember the future more. And I think one way that we could do that, perhaps, is to actively set aside time um, to remember the future. You know, perhaps an example like might be a kind of annual future generations day. And then you think, well, what what could that involve? Would it be an equivalent to like the kind of minute silence where we all pause and reflect on the fact that we are, as we saw in the video, connected to many generations spooling out from our present moment or something more festive, you know, like a kind of music or arts festival where we kind of bring together creative ways of thinking about the future or something else you know, maybe a, a kind of a way of commemoration that's organized around action you know doing something that's or oriented to the future but time set aside when we reflect on and remember that the, the decisions we take now are going to be the the world that people will live in in generations to come i'm, I'm for a festival Definitely. Uh, you, Laura, you guys, what do you think? Uh, definitely. Yeah. Dancing. Let, yeah, dancing. No, not, not the way I dance. No, you don't want that. Um, if we're going to have a festival, I think we should go right to the far north because there's something timeless about Ortonry and Chetland. And, and, and that's Absolutely. where we're going next because this next card, the futures we tell are the futures we make, Laura. Absolutely. So um, welcome all of you to Orkney, islands off the northeast coast of Scotland, a yeah, place of uh, myths, Quite extraordinary uh, lights, aurora, all sorts of things. And it's also a place where people don't anticipate that the future is also being made. And I think that's for me what this is about, to remember that the future is not something that's ephemeral or over the horizon or disconnected from us. But actually, in order to have a future, we, we make it every day. We make it in reading bus timetables and train timetables and turning up for YouTube video events. Um, and it's only in the ways that we actually make the future um, that we can, you know, we, we do those actions and we change the future by doing it. 
And that for me is really important because not only are we doing, you know, mundane things like, you know, reading timetables, but also when we talk about the future, we tell science fiction stories, we tell uh, stories in policy documents, we tell the future in lots of different ways. And of course, the way that we tell the future makes it possible. What we imagine changes our actions, changes the world, and makes that future potentially happen. So for me, it's really important to remember that we kind of have an accountability and a responsibility to make choices about which futures are we going to talk about? Which futures are we going to tell? Whose futures are we going to tell? Whose futures are we going to listen to? And whose futures are we going to leave silent? So for me, it's this, you know, building what, you know, you just said there with your card, David, it's remembering that we're going to be telling futures and that makes a difference to the future itself. And that's really powerful and quite exciting. So might we think about thinking about telling stories that are livable futures, so not telling apocalypse stories, you know, the world is ending. Well, actually, I'm not interested in the world ending. And one thing I've learned about being higher up in Orkney, where they make 120% of their own electricity from renewables, is that the future is happening and it's possible and it's not just survival, but it's a place you can thrive in. So I think it is, uh, for me, it's, a, it's about telling stories that are livable, livable futures that we can share, we can tell. And then if we tell livable futures, maybe we can live in them. You see, when, when I was growing up, a very long time ago, Laura, um, the future was a, was a positive place. It was full of the USS Enterprise that was running around with its lovely, diverse cast. All the very short skirts for the women, I always remember. I used to think, how can they sit in those seats? Their, their bums must be freezing. <laughs> but um, it seems to me that science fiction's got gloomier. So perhaps something we'll come back to about the futures that we imagine. But on that note, the next card is not that encouraging. <laughs> it says, all that great talk, and then all of a sudden, uh, and it's as close to you, Suzanne, it's design for decline, which sounds like me every morning. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I recognise that too. The, um, no, I mean, I think this is, this is very oblique. This is, this is quite oblique, but actually I think, I mean, I'm carrying on the thought about um, thinking like a gardener, not an architect, but I can't quite shed off the architect bit. And actually we do, you know, imagine futures and train ourselves in how we imagine, how we design. But obviously the emphasis has been very much on um, beginnings, on things, or on sorry, non endings um, that are very much the con architect's conceit, which is that I am the author of the action that's going to happen mm -hmm. and it's going to happen in this way and this is the start of it. Whereas what happens if we um, think about different beginnings and different endings that are all entangled when we're involved in projects? So uh, you might be thinking about geological beginnings and endings. You might be thinking about other animals. You might be thinking about atmospheres, um, previous inhabitants and dwellers, other knowledges. So mm -hmm. the, the, the amazing sort of indigenous sort of knowledge about living in the world differently that might be connected with if you think differently about what it might be to design. And the decline bit is that everything does have an end. You know, things have different life cycles. So mm. we are usually, and, and Roman's video talks about the human lifespan in relation to, you know, this extraordinary earth um, time scale and, and the deepness of it, which I'm sure David could say more about. Whereas actually we, we can think on a smaller scale of, you know, the time scales of, of insects, of, mm. you, you know, kind of wind patterns, all sorts of things. And if we then are able to absorb that more and acknowledge that when there's decline, there's also new life. So things can happen because something's stopped or because something's dormant or because it's um, appearing differently, then I think that's quite a positive thing. What decay and decline? Um, I think it, I think it, I think we need to embrace it. I think we need to embrace it and understand that that means that design. So, for instance, a building is often, you know, there's a lifespan, you know, yeah. built into the, the building. It may be for mortgage companies, it's 25 years. You know, yes, th this is dictating the lifespan of what we build, uh -huh. whereas Google headquarters in London is actually built for 150 years. Why? Why should they have much more of a, a sense of a life of their institution, their building? Mm -hmm. I think that's about values and that's about what we are collectively um, inscribing in, um, you know, economists are modelling. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's falling down to the construction industry who's funding projects, etc. So it's a um, bit sinister. <laughs> 120 years of Google. <laughs> well, I'm maybe they'll stop. Maybe they will maybe decline. They will. Maybe they will. Maybe they will. <laughs> well, I mean, all empires come to an end, you know. And, um, and you're saying about decline, and, and you should see the price of my time delay moisturiser. It's ridiculous, <laughs> and it doesn't work. And and the next, the next one. Now, this I can't imagine Brian Eno flung a card at David Bowie's head, 
Well, oh, maybe he did with, a, yeah. with this written on it. What do you think, David? Oh, yeah. Abandoned normal instrument. This, this is one of the original cards. This is uh, one of the original cards. This is cards. one of the original cards. We decided to uh, use a few of them because, you know, they're, they're, they're such great prompts. Um, I, it's not my favourite one. In fact, my favourite one of the original cards is take a bath. <laughs> <laughs> If you're feeling you're declining. <laughs> yes, if you're... <laughs> if you feel like you're declining, <laughs> take a bath. But Actually, it's very good. <laughs> yeah, often the answer is, is to be found um, in, in, in the water. But I think what that points to and what this, this card points to as well is that, you know, these oblique strategies, they're not about you know, spinning off into wild new territory. They're about actually the, the answers that you need are already to hand. You know, or they're already within. It's just about taking that just shift in perspective. So abandon normal instruments in a music studio that might be, you know, put aside the drum kit and get out the pots and pans or something like that. But um, you know, in the situation we face, where you know we are, um, you know, faced with multiple different cr ecological crises on on many different fronts um, that are, you know, not just going to affect our lives but the lives of many people that will come after us. You know, what, what are the the instruments that we might use that we haven't thought of or haven't given enough credence to. I'm wondering what role art can play in, mm. in addressing the climate crisis. And as an example, there's a wonderful um, artist based here in Scotland called Katie Patterson, whose work is expressly addressed at imagining the future, much in the way that, that Laura was talking about. One of her most, um, I think, uh, well-known projects is called Future Library. And it's a library in, in um, well, it will be a library in Norway. Uh, she's, she's planted a forest uh, in Norway. And every year she asks a new writer to write a piece of work, a short story or a poem that will go into the library, but it won't be read for a hundred years. And when at the end of that hundred year period, the forest will be cut down, the works will be printed and they'll be available for people to read. The first work was written by Margaret Atwood. Oh. And, and there have been writers, you know, of, of world stature who've contributed. But it's an exercise in trust. It's an exercise in trust on many levels, saying that, you know, that th this library will still be here, this story will still be told. Uh, it's a gift to the future. Mm. And in all kinds of ways, it reorients our sense of connection. So what can art, if art, art is an unusual instrument to apply mm. to the climate crisis, how can it perhaps... And um, can I just check, will they get the royalties paid? I don't you know, I don't think so. Sorry, I don't hate to so. be Presbyterian about this sort of thing, <laughs> but, you know, art is lovely, but you, you can't pay the mortgage I with it. I think that. it's one of the things you sign up for. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this. your three, forget your mortgage. Yeah. <laughs> and now, um, going back to you, Laura, and we actually, because you, you mentioned it, the, the um, overproduction of electricity up in Orkney, but of course Orkney is, is fairly central to quite a lot of fuel decisions these days and so this makes this card really apt for you because it says energy never ends and i love this but there is hope please tell us there's hope oh uh, yeah there is hope and i feel like i'm kind of living in it in uh, by being in orkney um you know orkney as i said it's, it's not so much overproduction orkney could produce so much more renewable energy um, when you live in Orkney, anyone who's been here and probably in large parts of northern Scotland as well, you feel the wind. Um, you step outside, it presses on your face. You know, the sea is out there. You see the, the, the waves, the tides here are incredibly powerful. And um, so it's something that you understand that there is energy in the environment itself and you feel it on your skin. It's very visceral. It's a force. And that's really important because, um, you know, when we're talking about energy, we're talking about energy futures. And this issue about how we're going to move into the future, thinking about our relationship with electricity, our relationship with energy, what's that going to be? And remembering that energy is something that, A, it's something we have no relationship with, we experience. But more than that, energy can never be destroyed. There's a basic, in physics, there's a basic conservation of energy. Um, you know, you can't destroy energy in the universe. It can only be transformed to different forms. So waves, tides the sun, starlight even, all can all just have their energy transformed into a different form, into electrical energy. And that's how we make electricity in whatever form. It still always has to come. And all that's happening is energy is being transformed from one form to another. And that's all. And that sense in which the choices that we have are open because we can make choices about where we want to do that transformation, how we want energy to transform, where to. And we're never going to destroy anything. It's simply going to change form. And I find that a really hopeful way of thinking about our future and our energy future. Just that memory. We're not destroying anything. We're changing its form. And that's quite powerful because 
firstly, it reminds, or it certainly reminds me that what matters is the infrastructure, the cables, the devices, the machinery, the power plants, right? We need all this stuff to do that transformation. That gives us choices. Which stuff do we want? Where do we want the cables to go? So we have all this fantastic renewable energy in Orkney, but we're stuck up here because we've only got one little grid cable that goes from Orkney across the Pentland first to mainland Scotland to feed the whole country. And that cable is only able to carry a certain amount of electricity. So that dictates how much energy we can generate and, and share with the rest of the country. And that's true across the grid, across the national grid. All these discussions that are happening at the moment about energy are often about cables, they're often about electricity, they're often about you know, pylons, all those things. So for me, the hope that remembering that energy never ends is a pointer to the fact that it only transforms, we're not destroying anything. And remember that it is a story and an understanding that we get choices about what infrastructure we want. Does, does anyone else ever get that idea when you talk about cables? I mean, that somewhere up in Norton, there is one cable and it's plugged into the wall, and somebody, a cleaner, comes in with a hood and goes, Oh, sorry, and the whole grid goes down. It's <laughs> probably happened. It's probably happened. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, and, and I'm sure that some wee woman somewhere is going, Oh, sorry about that, and plugged it back in again. And now, this, I like this because there's a real smack of Presbyterianism about this. <laughs> Suzanne is like, Get on with it. And it's less intentions, more inventions. Get on with it. <laughs> yes. Well, it's about doing. It is about doing. I mean, choices, I think that's really interesting. You know, sort of there are so many choices. There's so many options for us to um, way we think about it. And I mean, I'm feeling very much that we're sort of bombarded with directives, you know, with, um, you know, imperatives, declarations all around climate. Mm. Um, and it's something that's very, very hard to take, you know, because you feel helpless. You feel you do feel bombarded. Um, and we do need strategic thinking and working. But equally, we also need to move. We don't want to be paralysed. And um, so I, my suggestion with this oblique strategy is that we become less intentional or we become more inventive. Now, architecture plays with less and more all the time. You mm -hmm. know, less is more, less is a bore, blah, blah, blah. That's kind of been a little bit of a... Um, a, a, a thread through the discipline because a lot of it's about judgments about more or less of things it's not about one or the other so I sort of feel that we're in a world of degrees of choice of limits of mm -hmm. beginning to understand where a good limit is where tipping points are and then being able to sort of work with that and I mean I think a little bit of a reference to, to David's um, card earlier card um, I'm going to packed to Brian Eno. So he also said um, in where the one of the um, Think Like a Gardener quote came from, a really smart city is one that harnesses the intelligence and creativity of, of its inhabitants. Right. So I suppose my hopefulness <laughs> is that we are going to unleash a kind of creativity which is unlimited. You know, we, we, we need to limit, we need to stop, you know, embodied carbon, we need to limit operational energy in buildings and cities. We need to think about water use, all these things we need to sort of calibrate. But actually we can be inventive, we can still dream, we can still make amazing places. And I think that's our task. It sounds to me as if you're actually all still asking for more, for just us to be inventive not to expect inventions that will solve things. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think it's a call for us to, to act, not to expect. I think we need, um, I mean, it's interesting, the professional body of architects has, has brought a big report out, which um, called Built for the Environment. So trying to uh. see the client as possibly not just an individual who's wanting to make lots of money. And I think rightfully is actually saying we do need regulation. We do need things which are going to structurally change. But I think we can act. I think we can make moves mm -hmm. and Brian Eno again, build a brick, not a wall. So we can start small. And if, you know, if you make a brick, it could be a circular wall, it could be a straight wall, it could yeah. be a tower. You know, it can be many things. Whereas if we think too far about it being something that's already a bit prescribed, we'll limit ourselves. So unleash your own imaginations. I think People, so. Get on with it. So start so. building bricks. Lego, brilliant. <laughs> Don't stand on Lego in the middle of the night. That's really sore. Coming to objects, David, back to you. This mm. is a lovely card here. What is the object's story? Yeah, so I think one of the problems that we have is how we look at things. And we tend to have what you might call a kind of extractive perspective, as in we look at what use things can be to us. You know, it's that idea that, you know, we, we sort the world into things that are useful and things that aren't, and it's a very binary thing. 
and that excludes so much. It excludes a sense of you know what what's the life of 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 the the object or the resource that we're looking at. And I think thinking about everything as possessing a story, and and more particularly of of that that story as we saw with the video, stretching back into the deep past and into the deep future is a really helpful way to, again, to reorient our perspective. Any object that we see around us has the potential to leave a kind of fossil trace in, in, in the future rock record. Um, you know, it may not be this particular keep cup, but perhaps a plastic object like it, or you know, the kind of the the uh, what is this kind of kind of formica table or something like that. We're surrounded by made things, synthesized materials, concrete, glass, plastic, steel. All of these things are highly durable, and something of them is going to persist in in the future fossil record. There'll be traces of us. Mm. Um, in 10,000, in a million and more years' time. Anyone who was around to, to find this would be able to, to reconstruct elements of how we live now. So in effect, we are telling stories to the deep future. So any object that we look at, mm -hmm. I think, if we think about what is the story of this object, you know, think where has the material come from and what might its future be, will connect us to that sense that everything we do is telling a story to the deep future, mm -hmm. um, to future generations. And then we have to think, what do we want that story to be? Mm, quite a lot of concrete in our future. Quite a lot of concrete. And contrary to what you may have heard recently, <laughs> no, concrete doesn't grow. Concrete. And moving, <laughs> things grow on it. Things grow on it. Things grow on it. Uh, but going from the what is the object story back up to Laura, uh, this is a lovely follow on. Uh, monuments endure. Care endures. First of all, it's a, a lovely mantra, but what does it mean? Well, it actually follows really nicely on what David was just saying, um, because Hawkley is a place, and I'm sure it's true for many people who are listening, uh, but Hawkley has a, a, a lot of monuments. It has a, a World Heritage Site, and it has uh, stone circles, chambered tombs, it has Iron Age, it has kind of... Um, you know, Viking age, you can't move for Orkney, as contemporary archaeology of wave and tide devices, for goodness sake. So um, you kind of move for a landscape here that's made of time. And uh, George Mackay Brown, who is a literary author from Orkney, said that Orkney imagination is haunted by time. Because as you walk through a place, and it's true for everywhere we walk through, you are walking through time because you're walking through buildings. But in Orkney, the thing that stands out for me is when I'm standing in a stone circle like the Ring of Braga, it's 5,000 years old. And that means it's endured for 5,000 years. Those stones have been assembled and put in that place. It's surrounded by a, a, bit, a ditch and... That means that when I'm standing there, I can think, okay, I'm standing in time. I'm standing in the deep time that David just talked about. But that also means that when I'm standing there, I can imagine and realize that I might also be standing in a place that will be here for another 5,000 years. So when I'm standing in something like a stone circle, but I'm true for many places, depending on the different materials, I'm literally standing in deep time because it is a, literally a place that's going to endure. And the thing that I find really important about that, that it, you know, I find so hopeful is the, is the memory, the memory that those stones were made to endure, but they kept enduring because people cared about them in the past and care about them in the present and will care about them in the future. So when we care about things, it's an act. Care is something that isn't just done inside our heads. You know, when we care about someone, we do things for them. Um, and so as choices, again, about what do we want to care about, because that is what is endure, what will endure. So when I'm wondering at what to care about, well, for me personally, I don't care so much about numbers in spreadsheets because I don't necessarily feel like they're the thing that wants to endure because numbers don't feel anything. The people behind those numbers feel things. And I care about the people that might be behind those numbers, for example. Um, and the, you know, I care about the things that are happening in the environment, the things we're talking about now, the spectacle of the sea. Um, so for me, remembering that monuments endure, also buildings endure, if we choose. It's not they magically endure by themselves, but they endure if we care. So monuments endure and the care, the things that we care about will also endure and that opens up choices to us. Well, those are our cards and and incredibly thought-provoking and as you say 
oblique strategies. So uh, just let's just recap again um, on, on exactly what an oblique strategy is. It's, it's basically not looking at a problem head on the way we've been doing traditionally. And we're looking at what's going on around the edges, um, almost almost a bit like, like sneaking around the side to see if there's some other way of dealing with the problem. I'm just wondering, now, you know, you, I have an ethnographer of the future, I have a literary critic, I have an architect. Usually people think climate change and the, the problems that are confronting us today are issues that can only be solved by scientists. And we're all sitting about waiting for people in white coats with, mm. with pipettes to tell us what to do. But you're showing us a way in which arts and, and crafts and writing and, and their ways, new ways of looking mm. at these issues. Do you feel that like you're kind of... You're kind of creating a new, almost like a new discipline, Suzanne. I kind of, I, I, I wouldn't claim as much as that, but I certainly think we need to sort of we need to shift our spotlight to use the the image from the film. And I mean, I was thinking about the issue of monuments and time. I mean, the shorter time periods are quite difficult to visualise. So there was an amazing. Um, I don't know if you saw in the the Royal Botanics, the Palm House recently. Oh yes, uh -huh. the Bermuda palm tree had yes. to be taken out. So it was literally at the early, the beginning of the industrial period, 250 years ago, it was shipped, you know, to Edinburgh, planted as part of a, a whole project of extracting, claiming territory, connecting it. But actually, understanding that's a 250 years growth, um, you know, in a building, we, it's very hard to see, you know, time spans. And so I think I think there are ways that the disciplines we have, back to the oblique strategies, working with what we've got. So I don't think we need a completely new disciplines. I think we need to sort of um, invert them, inflect them, um, l sort of slant them away slightly differently. So for architecture, I think it would be, who is the client? What is the brief? Make them more complicated. Um, and obviously in education, we can do a lot of that. We can open that those questions up mm. um, to, to students. And, and that has an influence, I think, on how how fields and disciplines get shaped because mm. then they start to become discussed and developed and honed as ways of thinking, as ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think it's a new discipline. I think it's it's um, re sort of reimagining re -imagining them. Mm. I mean, it's, it's that, it's so, Laura, oh, I was just about uh, to say, yeah. <laughs> up to work <Martin. laughs> No, I was just wanting to add to that because I think that the idea of, of, of reusing disciplines that we have I feel like that's one of the things that we're talking about. It's about reusing materials. It's about you reusing disciplines. And it's not necessarily about thinking about innovation as making new things all the time, but about reconstituting what we already have. And there's a phrase in the field that I work in um, by a, a fantastic uh, a researcher, uh, Professor Lucy Suchman, and she talks about artful integration. And I love that phrase because I think that applies to so much. So integrating what we have already, reusing what we have we have already, but doing it in an artful way, crafting it. And I think that's really true for you know when we're thinking about what tech, what we constitute as technology, um, you know what we what kind of new things. Well, maybe they don't have to be shiny and new, but maybe they're the artful integration of what we have already. And also, I feel that's partly what we're doing here as well when we're talking about bringing this a uh, rich array array of different kind of methods and thinking about things. Um, and thinking about, well, how do we ask and create methods and create questions, but do it in a way whereby we're going to, you know, integrate artfully and reconceptualize the questions that we have to answer, you know, answer questions um, in new ways. So, yeah, I, I just think that's a really nice way of kind of like rethinking how we uh, reuse disciplines. You see, that's, that, that's the thing, David. I mean, you know, when we mentioned the Iliad and and at the beginning and how, you know, two, three thousand years ago, some guys were just basically, you know, kicking about a beach in Greece waiting to invade Troy. And but that story um, is still part of our culture. How can we shape? But they never meant that to happen. No. They, you know, nobody said Achilles have had a great idea. Why we should make a screenplay out of this. <laughs> that never actually happened. But how? So how can we purposefully create stories for the deep future? I think we have to remember that that um, care for the future begins with care for the present, and not for, you know one. I think one of the it's easy to suppose that thinking about developing a long term perspective means forgetting about um, about what's going on now, about how people are suffering now and, and, and vulnerable now, and that's not the case at all. Um, I think developing a kind of a long term perspective involves us thinking about you know how do we start right now, creating that that heritage that legacy of care that um you know that that will endure you know you mentioned the iliad you know i i, I agree i don't think that uh, homer or 
Homer as plural, who you know, whoever Homer wrote, and the boys. Homer and the boys. <laughs> the, what they were interested in doing was entertaining people in the moment. You know, gathered around the fire or in the in the drinking hall. You know, telling stories that would keep people engaged. And they were concerned about the about that very you know intimate, immediate moment, and and telling a story that would captivate people. But that's what's lasted. It mm -hmm. was that that investment in the present that has created something that's endured and it's the same i think for us you know we need to begin by caring for the present and and allowing that care to um grow into the future well you see that's but suzanne you said um an architect looks at a finished thing mm -hmm. this is where we're going yes but yes. you're asking us to think more about this is where we start from. Yes, and, and well, and also it matters how you progress, how you, how you how you put things together. So that's also that's also how you work with people as well as how you make things, um, and I think they're connected. I mean, there is something about you know well an amazingly crafted um, brick that that mm -hmm. becomes part of a piece of something imagined, and you know in the in Roman's book the um, there's a whole chapter on cathedral thinking, which is really interesting. Um, to think about, and he uses the example of Sagrada Familia in Barcelona, mm. um, which, you know, there was one architect, you know, so it's a very unusual case, whereas the, the great medieval c cathedrals, um, you know, were generations to be built. Oh, yes. But, but they, were, they, were, um, they were made in parts, but they didn't necessarily have one big aesthetic vision. There was a collective project that it was going to be good to build in this place, and usually of this material. So the choices of working specifically mm. for me is where it's at. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something about being very careful in the specific. Mm -hmm. So that's the people around you, the cultures around you, which may be, you know, marginal as well as the, the ones that have some power. You know, how are they included in the processes? Because that can enrich things, but also, you know, choices of material. So, you know, stone was available. It doesn't necessarily need to be shipped or it doesn't need to, we don't need to, you know, burn and make, you know, all this, you know, carbon with, with so much concrete. Mm. Um, there are op alternatives. alternatives for that. There are alternatives to that we can So I think, I think there's, we can't, we do, we, we're always in process. I think we're always in process. I think it is a myth that we're always finished. But I mean, again, Brian Eno, unfinished is fertile, mm. is, is kind of a really nice way of thinking about it. So there's a, something fertile that allows openings for others to connect with. Mm. See, we, um, as a culture, we don't like that, and we don't like that we as don't a culture like because no. it has because to be finished. We, well, it's be, it has to be finished because then it can be bounded and given a value, and then it can be traded. And so the queen can, open which is the it. same for, and, <laughs> which is the same for a building. You know, it's mm. the same for a product. It's the same for a bridge. Some, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Because we just like well, you can't have an unfinished bridge, obviously. <laughs> that that would not that would not be good. That would not be good. Um, I've got um, a, a question. Don't forget if you have a question, fire it in on the chat box function on YouTube. We'd love to hear from you, and we'll put your questions to the panel. But um, I've got a question from Moira. Um, I appreciate the positivity from Orkney. <laughs> I mean, um, not much sunshine, but lots of positivity. I appreciate the positivity from Orkney. I'm hopeful that our future is in good hands. If we start believing that we can build a good future, it changes the conversation. This does kind of go back, Laura, to what I... When I was growing up, many long time ago, um, the future was quite... was considered to be quite positive. Um, we, were, we were going to improve constantly. There was going to be jetpacks. I never got a jetpack. What happened to that? And and the world was going to get better and better. But we're living in a quite a dark time now. Do you find that you, you have to challenge that view of the future? You want to make it more positive? I don't feel I'm necessarily challenging it per se. I think it's about who you talk to. Um, and um, for me, I would say that it's the one thing I've learned by being in, up here in Orkley, collaborating with the organisations, communities here. There's a sense of well, we've been here for 5,000 years. People have been farming in Orkney. It's, it's the main industry in Orkney um, for, you know, 5,000 years. And there's a sense of, well, we're, we're going to be here for another 5,000. So we better figure it out. And more particularly, you know, Orkney is a long way away from Westminster and Holyrood. Um, sorry, I'm a long way away from you. Um, but, uh, you know, Orkney is closer to the Arctic Circle than to London. Therefore, there's a sense in which, um, you know, in Orkney, we're not waiting for somebody else down south to notice where Orkney is and change all the rules and regulations to make it all work perfectly. Um, so it's a very much a self-determination, self-determined sense of, well, we better get on and make our future. And, you know, because we're not, if we wait 
for government to make the you know everything exactly just right it's not going to happen so there's a very uh strong sense of who we are in this with and i think that goes back to your point that you were making suzanne about you know making this decision this question and decision about looking around you who am i in this with who do i share my future with um you know we have a phrase uh from a colleague of mine john haraway who talks about staying with the trouble and for me it's not just staying with things that are troublesome but figuring out who you share the troubles with as well and that might not be necessarily geographically co-located it could be someone sort of like further away but it means you've got allies and that's important because you have allies you can sit down and work together and collaborate together and the future is never an individualistic one person saving it heroic thing it's um it's us working together it's groups of people working together so for me that i don't feel like i'm, I'm challenging um you know this kind of like sense of pessimism i feel like i'm channeling a sense of the possible and that you know we don't have to save the whole world we can just go well okay what can i do where i am who am i in this with you know what troubles do i share with others what can we do within the limits of the possible that i have before me that's, um, I've got another question for you, but first of all, because of some of the things that you just said, I'm going to go to David, because um, you, you talked about troubles and allies. Do you think as a writer and, and someone who looks at the world in that sort of narrative form, you, you can see clear, more clearly the allies that we should have? Because we're constantly being driven apart, the way that the world works just now. Mm -hmm. In fact, Oblique Strategies is about finding out who actually your allies are. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, I think... Um, I think one one of the things that stories can do is connect us in ways that we don't we we perhaps didn't appreciate before. I mean, and I, I really love Laura's idea of who who you know who am I in this with and who, yeah. and who am I sh whose trouble am I sharing? Who's sharing my trouble? Um, and you know, often that does you know mean that we are um, you know we're thinking very much locally and immediately. But I, I think it's important to remember that we're also connected to places that that might seem very distant. You know, you know things that I buy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, today or energy that I consume will affect people on the other side of the world in various different ways. Where we are also kind of sharing our trouble with people who might seem very distant, and and so perhaps that's something that stories can do is create that sense of allyship and, and kinship and togetherness um, with people that we might otherwise, you know, just feel to be very remote, very different, and distant from us. You see, it's one of the things about, about battling something like the, the, the climate change emergency right now is that people wouldn't necessarily put the word climate emergency and story in the same paragraph, and same sentence. And yet it's important. It's a powerful tool. Yeah. Oh, the, the thing about climate change is it's very hard to point to. Um, it, <laughs> it's not a single event. It's not just happening in one place. I mean, it, its effects are felt in different places and in some places very severely now and in other places less so, but it's hard to point to something and say that that's it. And so I think we need that sense of a larger narrative to be able to put all of these different event, mm. events in. Otherwise, we just, you know, we can just tell ourselves, well, it's not it's not climate change. It's just an unusually warm, um, you know, winter or it's a mm. one in 500 year storm. But actually, we need that sense of a, um, you know, a narrative of events connected together in the bigger picture. Actually, I've noticed it's, it's like it used to be one in 500 years, now it's one in 250, and then it's, it's one in 10. It's every year. <laughs> yeah, it's getting shorter, shorter, shorter. Um, just before uh, we, Suzanne, we've got a question uh, back up, back up to, to Orkney. Um, energy might well be conserved in every exchange, but are we still destroying it? That is, turning into some form less useful, usable. Um, yeah, no, I think that's about, you know, what the choice I mentioned about what are we turning it into? So, yes, I think this is absolutely the right question to ask. Um, it's a question of what do we choose to transform this energy into? And, you know, uh, we could transform it into things that are, you know, particularly kind of dangerous or harmful um, in the case of nuclear power and the issues of, of, of what we do with nuclear waste. Um, you know, do we transform it into things which are incredibly static and difficult to, 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 you know, that won't decay over a long period of time. Um, so those are absolutely, for me, I think that, you know, that question is, is, is absolutely spot on that um, it is about those choices. But for me, remembering that energy is just being transformed. It is not being destroyed. That for me does open up the possibility of, of thinking those are, the, those are the choices we're making. And that I think is important to remember. Um, so yeah, I have other things to say, but I am keen, keen to hear other questions. Well, actually, um, th this next one kind of brings you all in, really, because um, is it easier to have that sense of getting on with it, like in Orkney, 
uh, in places with smaller populations that might feel a bit more cohesive than we do in cities. So I'm going to come to you, Suzanne. You know, is it a problem that as cities grow bigger and bigger and more people move to them yeah. and kind of like they, they kind of like expand and, and people yeah. just don't feel like the city belongs to them? Yeah. So yeah. they so is it a problem for cities? I, I think it's really and again it's a super interesting question. It's really complex because cities are not they're organic. They're they're full of many 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 different forces mm. in life and they're not necessarily controlled. Um, you know in a singular sort of way and and so I think they're an amazing sort of place of creativity of extraordinary sort of things that happen um, so some of it I think is finding your place and therefore you can act but there are also lots of I mean in, in the whole sort of um, there's a really extraordinary sort of body of literature I suppose which looks at so sort of developing countries yeah. and thinking about um, how people make do and how you improvise when things are stacked against you and the inventiveness you know and it becomes the arts of practice and you know actually there's a there's a sort of um a kind of working within that complexity yeah. that is about really knowing what's going on and being able to navigate it in some way which then becomes something that that becomes um, a useful skill and it's a way of being that is actually quite empowered um, and i think we've lost that because we've professionalized we've basically sort of said we'll be experts who will do the roads and we, we kind of do need some expertise about you know oh. bridges and roads and you know sort of things that that work but equally i think we could be more active um in you know in, in sort of how we engage um, in different ways but I think it's it's very it's very tricky because we have invented a whole lot of systems of power of um, resource allocation yeah. which don't always make that so easy and so possible so there's a lot of working around I think that, that feels like how we really operate to try and make things happen mm. in cities I don't know if that's a if that yeah, uh, seems resonates absolutely you know all i'd add to that really is i think there's nothing like living in a city to remind you that you live in a deeply storied place yeah. you know yeah. that, that, that you know edinburgh for example is it just it wears its its entire history on the surface in a sense it's such a, a place that's layered with different lives different stories different periods and it's a perpetual reminder that you know we you know the present where we're living in and is the product of that history and therefore you know the the future that we make will carry that on do you laura do, do you think it's it's easier to regain that sense of community in somewhere like orkney i think it's a complicated question because i've been you know part of communities and cities as well and i think that you know it's always really important to not kind of think that you know People who live on islands aren't some like magically communal happy people, right? It's it's you know everybody's um, um, just kind of living together in kind of different ways in whether they're cities or whether in rural areas or suburban areas. And communities form in lots and lots of different locations. Um, I think the thing I would say is that um, there is a sense of the need to focus on the future, certainly in Orkney and quite a few other places where you have relatively sort of smaller groups of um, communities that are bound together. Um, so I don't think, you know, it's about the kind of like the geography of it, but the sense of if we don't, if we don't act now, um, we're not going to be here. So in Orkney, I can, you know, uh, look out my window and look across the kind of like Pentland Firth. We've got islands here like Stroma, um, which have de de depopulated. There's no one living there. Um, you know, people listening might know the island of St Kilda, which, you know, once had a community of people. There's no longer people living there. So the idea that actually there are, there are places in the world which will depopulate um, and the entire society, all the stories we're talking about, and that diversity could be lost. So, um, that, and that's true for everywhere, but I think it's particularly true and sensed and felt in uh, places at the edge, um, which are a little bit more precarious maybe, uh, which is why I think places at the edge are so potent uh, places to be when thinking about the future. Um, so Bobby has, uh, thanks Bobby, great question, um, joined us for a question. Um, and everything you're talking about is fantastic. You're all talking about the deep future. However, I think Bobby has just got a dash of lime juice here. Um, <laughs> Very bleak. <laughs> how do we change our socio-economic system into something that incentivizes the health and happiness of all stakeholders, including the planet, over shareholder profit quickly enough? So it's all very well talking about, you know, seeing the end product or writing the stories or being positive about the future, Laura, but how are we going to do it in a hurry? 
Well, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I actually think we need expertise from others um, reconstituted. So the economists, I mean, Nicholas Stern talking mm. about the, the um, 15 years since the um, Stern report and saying we have to act quicker. But there, there's a sort of sense. So, so who has got the power to change? It probably is the people with capital. There are some shifts, you know, so maybe investment in, in pensions and, you know what I mean, are going to shift into different areas. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's got to have some combination of, um, I mean, my opinion, some combination of structural, um, but also peer pressure, a kind of peer pressure that, that we can't sit around and wait. And I don't think it's going to come necessarily from governments. I think it's going to come from um, people re-shifting capital and actually saying, actually, this is going to be the future. So it's going to be it's going to be climate mitigation. So we're going to make decisions about investment, you know, mm -hmm. in Orkney about tide. You know, we're not going to invest back in um, mm -hmm. you know, the coal field. Yeah, I mean, so I'm not, it's not an answer, <laughs> but that's my I mean, that's I suppose where I don't think architects are going to solve it. I think we'll still be <laughs> making bricks. <laughs> <laughs> and very gardening. good bricks as well. Oh, yeah, and beautiful gardening. Bricks. And very good bricks. Beautiful let's, bricks let's, in let's a just, beautiful garden. Let's just check out in Orkney. I mean, I mean, have you got any? I mean, how, how are we going to start that now? <laughs> happening and that's the first thing to say um that um you know this idea that somehow we, we have this phrase we talk about the anthropocene um this idea that we're in this age where um humans have changed the entire planet it's debated it's complicated but some of the people i work with talk about the capitalocene that actually the thing we should be talking about is how capital has changed the planet and that's the age we should be focusing on and of course when we think about it that way which is i think what your uh, what the um person who asked the question was talking about um, we sometimes feel a bit sort of caught up with the idea that it's, it's all about money, it's all about capital, and it's somehow monolithic and sure everywhere, and it feels so hard to change something that seems so pervasive. And yet, wh when I think about something like the capital scene, I also remember that it isn't true everywhere. I think that's what you were just saying, Suzanne, in the fact that we still, we trade things, we do each other favours, we do so much which is not necessarily directly about money already. And in different places in the world, that happens to greater and lesser extents. So I think for me, it's almost like, well, noticing the gaps, noticing the fragments, noticing the fact there's actually already cracks showing in how we kind of work. And it's not monolithic. And therefore, we can think about where do we want to open those cracks? And more importantly, how do we make sure that people don't fall through those cracks? How do we bring everyone kind of with us? So for me, it's about noticing the breaks and the ruptures and the differences and where they are. And also, again, sort of thinking through, OK, where are those happening? Where can we provide support for those cracks and make sure it's done in a way that's uh, that's going to bring people with us and not harm people at the same time? Thanks, Laura. I'm, David, I'm going to come to you for the, 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 one more question that we've got here. And the reason I'm going to come to you is because I do think this is tied up with the idea of narrative. Mm -hmm. Because uh, this question's come in, it says, although we may not want to wait for Holyrood or Westminster, doesn't real change require funding? And how is that access to political leaders are not in the same lane as communities? And it really is because the actual political leaders have a great deal to gain from keeping us separate, I think. But mm. I think it's the job of writers and people imagining the future to bring us together. How are you going to do that? Well, I mean, if I had a, a better answer than this one, I'd probably be around the delegates' table at COP um, giving it. But what I would I've say, heard the coffee not good. <laughs> what I would say is that I think if if we're all asking, you know, it's about what are the questions we're asking of ourselves and of our elected leaders, and are we are we asking are we asking the right questions? Are we all pulling in the right direction? This question that we've all been, um, it, you know, exploring this evening how can we be better ancestors? What if we were to apply that question to every decision that we make? In what ways does this further or, or kind of impact my ability to be a good ancestor? Um, if we bake that sense of, of a kind of long-term thinking and, and taking into account the rights of future generations in all kinds of decisions we make, whether that's individually or collectively, in terms of what we're asking our elected representatives to take seriously, then I think we can we can make profound moves in the right direction. So, in essence, and just kind of to, I was trying to catch all of this in one. How to be a good ancestor? So we don't want to be the sort of people that people in the future look back on and go, "What were they thinking?" Mm -hmm. So we are looking for small. Um, small solutions. I think noticing things and being generous. 
being generous mm -hmm. and what we're being generous. So generous. If you're going to make something, make it beautiful. If you're going to, you know, um, get involved in a community, do a little bit more than you might be. You know, that kind of world, I think. It, it might express itself in different ways. But it, I think we've got to, it's got to start with noticing, with looking noticing. at the world and whether it's time and understanding time, whether it's the sort of, you know, from what's immediately around you, where the gaps are. I love that phrase, Laura, about the ruptures and the mm -hmm. cracks. You know, it's, it's noticing and I think a responsibility to yeah. notice and then to speak about it. Because, Laura, that's a phrase you used more than once, uh, noticing the ruptures, noticing the gaps. So you want us to be more aware of the gaps. Where do we find them? Well, another question. <laughs> I think I think it's, it's, it's exactly what um, we're already talking about. It's, it's noticing the things that matter to you, the things that you care about. And it's, it's, it's asking the right kinds of questions like, where are the places and the things that are happening that are going to endure? So this question about, you know, kind of being a good ancestor for me is about kind of noticing the places where that's happening, where you kind of feel, oh, yeah, this is something that's happening. This is a place of... Um, you know, whether the, whether the future that's being made here is one that I want, you know, that I would like for it to endure and how do I participate in this? How do I support this? And that's true for individuals, whether, you know, they're kind of, whether they're, you know, leaders or managers or members of a community. Um, that for me is where it kind of like sits. It's, it's like what stories you're going to retell, um, whose futures you're going to participate in. It's been absolutely fascinating. We are running so out of time here so quickly. Um, but I just, I do want to be a good ancestor. I don't want people to turn up in the Antiques Roadshow in 2,000 years' time with something that I've thrown <laughs> in me and they've gone, oh, that bunch. Thank goodness we got rid of them. Thank you so much for joining us this evening and for looking at oblique strategies and bringing David Bowie into the discussion. <laughs> Can't thank you enough for that. Don't forget to, to join us again tomorrow. At 8 o'clock, we're looking at all sorts of other exciting things in the Changing World Conversation. Thank you up there in Orkney, Laura. Thank you for David and Suzanne. And thank you again for joining us here this evening. Bye-bye.